Welcome everybody and thank you to the Groton Public Library for doing this presentation tonight. This is a really important presentation uh, for me. It's something that I'm passionate about. Um, and I've been with LegeLight now for about 23 years. And when I first started, we were actually given a grant um, to uh, bring about more awareness and education around Lyme disease at that time. We were fortunate to work directly with people from the CDC, some of the greatest minds in the area of entomology at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, and also our partners at the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Um, and I would say that those are probably the three uh, agencies that I look to for accurate and up-to-date information. There is a lot of information about tick-borne disease, and I'm um, going to, for the next 45 minutes or so, just kind of dive right in um, and then save plenty of time at the end to answer your questions. Um, I would like to know, though, maybe a show of hands, um, how many of you would like to go out into the nature and woods, that kind of thing? And we have so many beautiful trails and open spaces here in Groton. I'm just amazed. I don't even think I've discovered all of them yet. How about camping? Any campers? Okay. Gardeners? Okay. Uh, kayakers? Okay. Anything that takes you off the trail, photography, bird watching, all kinds of wonderful adventures here in the town of Groton and in, in our region. Um, I always like to know how many people have property that abuts a wooded area? All right, most of us have that. And that's really important and we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. Um, but for the purpose of our presentation, um, when we were talking about doing something on Lyme disease, we've really rephrased the term Lyme disease to tick-borne diseases because there are so many now and things have really changed. So since 2004, it's kind of like, what do they say? It's not your grandma's Cadillac or something. It's not your grandma's tick-borne disease anymore. Things have changed. And so I really appreciate Anne inviting us here today. So just a little definition. So tick-borne um, diseases are um, illnesses that people can get from being bitten by a tick who has that illness. And those, those diseases can be viral, they can be bacterial, or they can be parasitic or um, you know, parasitic. So the most common, of course, is the ones that we think about, Lyme disease, right, which is a bacterial infection. It's treatable, but we don't want it. We want to prevent ourselves from getting it. Um, how many of you know somebody or have had Lyme disease? Okay, most of us have. Okay, and what about any other uh, tick-borne illness? Babesiosis, anaplasmosis, or lichiosis? Okay, so we're well aware of, of uh, tick-borne disease. So this is one of the reasons why Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases is so important to talk about. The first is that we're increasing the number of tick-borne disease cases over time. More and more people are getting sick with tick-borne disease in our area. Also, the expanding geographic range of tick-borne cases. Um, so not only is it confined to New England, remember we used to think of Lyme disease as a Lyme, Connecticut kind of thing. It's no longer the case. Also, there's a growing number of tick-borne agents recognized to cause human disease. Um, and so we'll talk about some of these. The need per, for prevention, it's never been greater. These are some of the tick-borne diseases in the United States. I added an asterisk to those that are reportable to the CDC and an at sign to those that are now reportable to the Department of Public Health here in Connecticut. At any time, you can go on their websites and find out where, um, where there are higher prevalence rates um, and also get up-to-date information. But you can see the ones that are most common here are Lyme disease, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis. These are the ones with Lyme disease being the most prevalent. 
How many of you heard of some of the other illnesses that are up there? Okay. Yeah, and what I find is that people are generally really informed about Lyme disease, and that really pleases me. This gives you an idea of the big ones here in Connecticut. Um, there have been some virus-related uh, tick-borne disease um, documented. Um, and you can also see that one of the things that we usually have with us are some tick cards. And these are little pocket cards and they give you an idea of how big the ticks are from one stage to another. The larval tick, the nymphal tick, and the adult tick. It's really the, the only uh, tick that's known to transmit Lyme disease is the adult female. So take note of what that looks like, the adult female. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so this is the adult female and also the, the nymphal tick, but not the adult male. So that, that gives you some idea. And the problem with that nymphal tick is look how small it is. In real life, it's about the size of a poppy seed. Very easy to overlook looks like a thousand freckles, you know? So um, it's really important to know how small they are. The lone star tick is growing in population, and then we're all used to that good old American dog tick. No. Okay. Um, so you can see the geographic area of some of these species of ticks. They've changed over time. If we laid map over map over map, one year after another, you would see a geographic change. The Asian longhorned tick is a little bit different than the black-legged tick that we're used to or the deer tick that we're used to, um, primarily because instead of waiting for us, it's called questing, this behavior that ticks have. So deer ticks usually wait on a blade of grass for us to come by. We brush by, they cling on to us, and away we go. The Asian long-horned tick actually seeks us out. It's a much more aggressive tick. You're sitting, minding your own business at a lawn party or you know, uh, having a picnic. It will actually come and seek out um, its host. That's a good question. Yeah, let's, let's, well, yeah, we'll talk about it at the end. So this gives you an idea. There's a three host life cycle for uh, deer ticks. They start as at the larva stage, and this is before they have any disease to transmit. They actually acquire uh, Lyme disease from feeding on the white-footed mouse or other rodents. Um, they drop down off the mouse and now they've ha they have um, Lyme disease or they could have Lyme disease, but they're done feeding. They wait in the leaf litter and then they come back the next year. And the next year they're usually looking for a larger host, like a deer. We come, you know, that's why I think we commonly call them deer ticks. Um, that's usually where they end up. But this um, three host tick life cycle, um, can be interrupted, and I'll tell you about some of the things that they're doing at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station to do just that. Um, the nymphal ticks are very small. They are out now, so they kind of come back uh, in May, June, July, and they're looking for um, their host, um, and they, the way that they do it is they have attached to um, their host. They um, suck the blood out of their host to fill their, their bodies, and that's how they move along to the next stage. Um, so you can see down here that up to 3,000 eggs are hatched from an adult female. You can also see kind of the questing behavior at the top, just kind of waiting for a host to come by. <clears throat> this gives you a little bit of information about the incidence of Lyme disease uh, town by town. 
Of course, we're always a few years behind when it, turn, when it comes to data collection and getting data out to the public. But this gives you an idea of some of the towns and cities that have higher rates of Lyme disease. I think it's fascinating to see this overlapping graph of Lyme disease uh, by month of onset. So the time when somebody would uh, be diagnosed with Lyme disease. And laying over that the season, the active season of the deer tick. We all know that we had a milder winter this year and deer ticks are active when it's 40 degrees or higher. I have a lot of friends that like to hike, uh, you know, during the winter months, and it's always uh, important to remember that temperature at 40 degrees. We had a really mild winter, didn't we? I love it, but at the same time, we have to know that we probably will have higher populations of deer ticks. So, one of the things that the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station does is they test ticks to find out if they are carrying any tick-borne diseases. Dr. Moulet from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station said instead of about 3,000 ticks last year that were tested, there were about 6,000 ticks. So either people are getting the word that they you know, would like to have the tick tested if it's attached to their body and they remove it um, well enough. Um, but there are also a lot of ticks that were sent in during the winter months and it used to be unheard of. This gives you the relative size of the adult versus the nymphal tick. Very different size easy to miss and we'll talk about kind of discovering them. Um, I went hiking with my husband and we went kayaking and when I got back I was just kind of playing around with my ring you know how you do and I thought darn I've got poison ivy again. Took my ring off and I had a, a tick kind of between my two fingers and had I not done that I would not have discovered it. They're probably a little bit more translucent. So, yeah. This gives you an idea of the larva hatching from eggs. We usually don't ever discover these, but it's happening all the time. Um, so, we talked about the first cycle of feeding for the tick being the white footed mouse. They also feed on birds, chipmunks, and shrews. And, um, you can see some of the ticks around the eyes of the bird, around the ears of the mouse. They like this particular area. It's moist. Uh, it's, it, the, the skin is a little bit thinner. They can attach easier. So we are just accidental hosts. We call ourselves accidental hosts. And it's really because they're not looking for us in particular. They're just finding us and we give them what they need as long as they can stay attached long enough. Um, they feed for several days. That's why it's important to do a tick check when you've been outside. Um, even going into the mailbox for some people. Um, even not going anywhere but having indoor outdoor pets for some. Um, so they do, they do feed for several days and the idea is to interrupt them and get them off of our bodies within the first 24 to 36 hours before they really start transmitting any kind of bacteria or virus they might have. So where do we get ticks? A lot of people think, well, I don't go hiking, so I'm, I'm safe. Um, but it's really not about that. It's really about being in their habitat um, and being exposed. So you can see that uh, when they, they asked people, where did you get you know, where did your tick come from? You can see that people outdoors um, at home is the biggest um, vote getter. Um, away from home, indoors at home, in the neighborhood, and then some of the activities that are associated with being outdoors, um, going camping, yard work, gardening, hiking, 
um, outdoor events. Um, but you can see again that um, it's a really a wide range of places. Um, I'm going to go back just for a second because I have to thank Dr. Kirby Stafford. He worked for the Connecticut Experiment, uh, our cultural experiment station for a long, long time. He was the head of our project here in Connecticut. He has since retired, but he took most of the photographs that you see here. So I have to thank him. So the black legged tick, these are some of the diseases that are transmitted by the black legged deer tick. Not all deer ticks have the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Only about 48% of the adult females and only about 15% of the nymphal ticks, the small ones. So while it's important to get those ticks off and remove them safely, I don't want people to not go out in the woods and to do the things that they love outside. Not every tick uh, carries agents that can cause us to be sick. Um, we estimate that between 30,000 and 300,000 cases of Lyme disease every year in the United States. And the reason why the two numbers are so different is that there are a lot of people, and maybe you've experienced this, that go to the doctors and they're treated presumptively. They don't have a positive blood test, for example. Uh, the doctor says, yep, your symptoms sound like they um, are um, compatible with Lyme disease. We're going to go ahead and treat you. Um, some other tick-borne diseases clear on their own. Some need medication. But there are a lot of cases in the United States. This is incidence by 10-year age groups. Any surprises? So you can see that young children are at risk and older adults. And what are we doing as older adults? Many of us have more time now that we're not working. We're outside more. Um, yeah. Watching the kids, that's right, we're watching the kids. <clears throat> so this gives you an idea. Um, also, Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases really um, can affect different people differently. As we age, we know that our immune system isn't as robust. Um, so some of the tick-borne diseases are actually more, um, we're more at risk for. Um, also, if we have other medical conditions, sometimes we can be more at risk. But I love this, though. It just shows how seniors are active. And it's changed over the years. If you looked at this maybe about 10 years ago, you'd see a lot more kids, a lot less seniors. So hoorah for us, right? OK. So let's talk a little bit about some of the early disease symptoms. Basically, if you feel like you have influenza, but it's July, go to the doctors. Um, if you feel like you have some of those flu-like symptoms, really that's when you need to seek medical care. So erythema migrans is that bullseye rash that we always hear about. Luckily, it's present in about 70% of cases, which is great because then you know, right, nothing else creates that. Um, it usually begins at the site of the tick bite, anywhere between 3 and 30 days. The average is about seven days. And it doesn't always look like that perfect bullseye. Sometimes there could be multiple rashes. Sometimes they could bleed into one another. Um, sometimes it's difficult to tell, depending on the color of skin. Um, so it's really important, get a second opinion. You know, call in your daughter or your husband. You know, call in somebody that can um, take a look at it. Sometimes it expands up to 12 inches or more. It may feel warm to the touch, but it's not itchy and it's not painful. Other tick-borne diseases can cause a rash that can be itchy or painful. Sometimes it clears the middle ring, like we talked about, having a central red area that enlarges, and it may appear on any part of the body. 
Here's some pictures. This gives you an idea. Some typical rashes, the one kind of on the bottom right is a little bit more difficult to see. The ones on the top are much more defined, gives you a better idea. So I describe sometimes having the flu or feeling really crummy as feeling like you got hit by a bus. So hence the, the little picture here. But some of the early symptoms are fever, chills, body aches, joint pain, swollen lymph nodes. Sounds like being hit by a bus, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So these are things to look out for. And these are kind of the same kind of vague symptoms that we have sometimes, right? Um, that's why it's so important to seek medical care. If, um, if Lyme disease isn't treated at an early stage, it kind of moves on. It takes hold in our body. Um, severe headaches, neck, neck, neck stiffness, um, arthritis. Sometimes people will notice um, some kind of arthritic um, symptoms in their knees, especially um, in their neck. Um, intermittent pain heart palpitations, an irregular heartbeat, and that's due to the kind of the signal between different sides of the heart, um, episodes of dizziness or shortness of breath, inflammation of the brain and spinal cord, nerve pain, shooting pains and numbness, problems with short-term memory. So again, some of these are vague, but you put them all together, and then you use them as part of the piece to the puzzle, right? and maybe you have your tick tested, and maybe it comes back positive for Lyme disease. Maybe you found a tick on your body. So you kind of start to put the pieces together. So some people say that their Lyme disease has never gone away. And there's a lot of controversy about this, but there's something that they've called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. It's a collection of symptoms. Um, and there's a lot of mystery about it, but it's usually when somebody's been treated for one of these diseases and the symptoms haven't gone away. Tick-borne diseases can be prevented by avoiding tick bites and promptly removing ticks. So we'll talk a little bit about personal protection. Um, many people have a lot of questions when it comes to personal protection. I think one of the first things to be aware of is tick habitat. Ticks like it where it's warm and moist. So under your pachysandra in the front yard, under the barberry, Japanese barberry bush in the woods. Um, they love honeysuckle and a lot of people have honeysuckle. It's really, really pretty, but it's habitat for ticks. Um, and then wooded areas. We have beautiful rock walls here in New England. Unfortunately, they usually gather a lot of leaf litter. They become hotels for small rodents who bring ticks into our yard. So uh, just understanding the tick behavior and tick habitat is really important. There are a lot of repellents that we can use. How many of you have heard of DEET? Okay, so for years and years, it's been our go-to. There are some other um, repellents and a repellent just repels the tick, right? It doesn't kill the tick, it just kind of says, don't come here. Um, repellents can, use, can be used on the bottom of your, your pants if you're out hiking, on the tops of your shoes, they can help repel uh, ticks and they work very well. Also dressing appropriately. I love Dr. Kirby Stafford when he would come to town and he'd be at a health fair and he'd have his white pants tucked into his white socks, tucked into his white shoes, because that is really the way to go when you're entering into a tick habitat. It keeps the ticks from climbing up on your skin um, and climbing underneath your shorts or attaching themselves to your waistband. It also gives you an opportunity to see them if they're on your socks, if they're on your pants. And we always you know, remind each other, if you see a tick on me, let me know. So um, dressing appropriately. 
And if hiking stay on the trail, and I don't know about you, but I had a dog for 15 years. The dog was never cooperating. But staying on the trail is great because usually the trail is dry and sometimes it's hot and it's a it's a habitat or it's a place that ticks really don't want to be. Checking your body for ticks when you come in um, from being outside is really important. So checking, you know, we'll talk about kind of where to check, but that's really important. And then also pets, you know, like Ann said, your dog comes in, check your dog for, uh, for ticks. It's really important. And again, some of those kind of mysterious places like between the webs of the feet um, or the bottom of the feet even, but around the ears, around the eyes, um, just really kind of doing a good once over. Drying clothes on high heat can really help. If you wash your clothing in warm water, it won't kill the ticks if you have ticks on your clothing. You need to dry your clothing for 10 minutes. Um, a lot of people have an area that when they come into their house, it's kind of like a laundry room. It's a great place just to strip down, throw everything in the dryer for 10 minutes and make sure that you're not bringing something that you picked up outside, inside. Also taking a shower within two hours of being outside. It does take a little while for the tick to attach. It's a really cool bug um, in terms of bugs. Um, it has in its saliva, it has chemicals that, that um, are kind of um, numbing so that you don't feel them attaching to you. They also have chemicals in their saliva that helps them stay attached. But it does take them a little while before they kind of get their groove on and start um, ingesting the blood from your body. So that's why they say within 12 to 36 hours, make sure you do a tick check, make sure you get them off. Yes. Yeah, so we'll talk about some of the alternatives. It's really the insect repellent. Um, also, permethrin is an acaricide, which actually kills them. Um, lemon eucalyptus oil is in more of a natural way, but there are a lot of myths and misconceptions about what will and will not repel ticks. All right, one of the other things that you can do, can you remind me how many gardeners there are here in your own backyard? Okay. So landscape management is something that Dr. Stafford worked um, and actually created a landscape management handbook that is available online. Um, but the idea is to really change the environment it's so it's not as hospitable to ticks. And that means moving um, playscapes out of the shade. You know, forever we were telling people because of skin cancer, get out of the sun. Now we're telling you to go back in. Um, but play areas that are in the shade, um, kind of near the, the side of the woods, is probably better to move that out. Keeping your, your trees trimmed can also allow more light to come in, which allows more heat and more drying. Um, also bird feeders. How many of you have bird feeders? All right, I love watching birds at my feeder in the morning. Love, love, love it. Um, but it's important to keep the bird feeder away from the house because not only does it attract birds to your bird feeder, but also rodents down below or bears. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I tried that slinky thing on my bird feeder and it didn't work. They figured it out and they climb right up the middle of it now. So especially chipmunks. Um, so bird feeders kind of away from the house. Um, many people here in Connecticut save firewood for the winter. It's important to have your firewood pile away from the house. So anything that's going to attract small animals or deer to your property, you want to push it back as far as you can. The other thing that they have determined is that a three foot mulch barrier between the wooded area and your play or living area in your backyard can really help. Only about 2% of ticks will travel through that way and get into your yard. 
Um, so it's a really great way to deter ticks from your property. Doesn't matter. The idea is that it's something that's dry and warm. Um, the same thing with removing leaf litter. We have a beautiful rock border, but it's a collection of leaves and all kinds of stuff, grass clippings, all kinds of stuff. So keeping our, our um, rock walls clear of debris, um, it just kind of has to be an annual chore. Please like save any questions you have on this. Um, the other thing is that um, back in 2004, we started some landscape demonstration projects and we were really excited here. They ha do have one here at Pequannock Plains Park. You may have driven in there a thousand times and not noticed it. It's off to the side, but it's a collection of plants that are known to be deer resistant. So, we put this together to give you a little bit of a better idea um, of where you can put your wood pile. You can see where the house is, but where you put your wood pile, your swing set, your wood chips along the back wall, your, your um, vegetable garden, and that's a whole nother project, getting um, small animals out of our vegetable gardens. But the swing set out in the sun, the deck kind of right there, it's a great, just kind of a layout for how we can um, adjust our landscaping a little bit. Um, <clears throat> my slides are out of order, I apologize. But this just gives you an idea of, you know, washing the skin treated with repellent. You wanna do that. Uh, if you've put on DEET, when you're done with the day, just wash it off. That's a good time to take a shower. Um, wash clothes to remove any repellent that you have on your clothes. Wash permethrin, which again is that a caricide. It's very strong. Um, we did a, a project a couple years back where we worked with all the municipal uh, departments that had uh, employees that were exposed to, dick, to, your, uh, to tick habitats because of their work, whether they're public works or the fire marshal, um, you know, um, utilities departments, um, and we talked to them a, a little bit about the fact that you can order permethrin-treated pants that you can wear uh, when you're outside doing work. Um, also, deer ticks can survive an hour in the wash, um, and they cannot survive 15 minutes to an hour in a hot dryer. So, good to know. All right, so, Promptly removing ticks. So let's get to that part. So let's say you've come home, you've had a great day outside. Um, these are some of the areas where you want to look and pay special attention to. And when you think about it, it's kind of shaded, it's warm, it's moisture, your hairline behind the ears, um, in and around the hair, under your arms, inside your belly button. So check that out. Um, also around the waist, for whatever reason, a lot of people end up with them around their waist. They've looked for a place to attach, um, and it's kind of where your pants hug the most. Um, also between the legs, back of the knees, and if you have sandals on between your toes, um, make sure that you check there. Tick removal is really important. Uh, you want to, and there's a lot of myths and misconceptions about how to remove a tick. Um, you want to use some fine tip tweezers if you have them. If not, the tip of your tweezers will do. You wanna make sure that you grab the tick mouth parts as close to the skin as possible. Um, you don't wanna squeeze the content of what's in the tick's gut back into your skin. So you want to kind of nip it in the bud, as they say. And then you want to slowly and with steady pressure pull upward. You don't want to twist. You don't want to yank. You want to just with slow pressure. Odds are that you get the tick to let go. Um, it's the best way. Um, and then you just want to clean the wound like you would any other wound. If for some reason you don't get the mouth parts out, and sometimes that happens, you wanna leave them there because your body's going to push them out just like a sliver 
it will may form a little bit of a local reaction and then before you know it it's out of your body um, but this gives you an idea it's a little harder on the nymphal ticks because they're so small you really want to get close to the skin so one of the things that local health departments do is work with the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station who does the testing. We collect ticks from people in the community who bring them in that want them to be tested. There's a few details that I want you to know. One is that the tick must be engorged. If it's flat, have you ever seen a flat tick? You know, you kind of see it, it's crawled on your arm, but you get it in time. If it's flat, um, they don't want to test it. And partly because they're going to be looking for the DNA of whatever bacteria uh, they're looking for or parasite that they're looking for. So you want to make sure that it's a tick that's been on you long enough so that it's uh, got that. Um, the other thing is that it doesn't make a lot of sense to test a tick if it hasn't been on your body for you know 24 hours uh, you want to complete the form that you can get on our website um, it's a free service you complete the form you put it in a crush proof container you don't have to put tape on it you know we've seen them every which way because people don't know right um, you don't want to put a piece of tape on it. You don't want to put it in alcohol or, you know, Vaseline or anything. Um, and you can, you know, just put it in a crush proof container. Some people use those old, old film canisters or a little tiny Tupperware or a pill box, something like that. Uh, then we send it off to the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And usually within two to three weeks, they have um, your results and those are emailed to you generally. So that gives you an idea. Um, so if you have more information, you can always look at our website. We try to keep it updated. But really, like I said, those three agencies for accurate and up-to-date information, the Connecticut Department of Public Health, the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, and they have some of their information on the back table that you can grab on your way out, um, and also the CDC when all else fails, right? We have the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and they do a lot of studies. One of the, the questions that I got before we started, and I did want to address that, is a vaccine. Right now, there is no vaccine for humans uh, for Lyme disease. They are doing some really exciting work at the Agricultural Experiment Station um, on a vaccine for mice, thinking that if they interrupt the cycle, right, if mice can't get Lyme disease, they can't give it to ticks, and then the ticks won't give it to the deer, and the deer, you know, so on and so on. So that's one of the things that they're doing. They're also, uh, for years and years, I know there's some people here from Mumford Cove. They did a, an experiment in Mumford Cove where they used um, mice bait boxes where the mice went in. They rubbed up against some fipronil as they were munching on the corn or whatever the bait was in the box. And then when they left, they would have that acaricide would kill the ticks that are on them. Um, so they've been doing a lot of different experiments. They have something similar with permethrin on kind of like big, large paint rollers. Um, they're called four poster deer feeders and the deer rub up against them. They put their neck in to feed on corn or whatever they have for bait. Um, and again, the ticks fall off and they die. So there's a lot of really cool things. Um, I'll also mention that the Agriculture Experiment Station on August 2nd has Plant Science Day in Hamden. It's amazing. Not only do you learn about all the plants that they're doing experiments with, like up and coming plants for Connecticut, like hops, but you also learn about all kinds of pests um, that we have that are either killing our trees or killing our flowers. You can bring a pest in a baggie and have it identified, or um, you can also bring a leaf off of a plant that maybe has some kind of disease and they can help you just, you know, help you to know what's killing your butterfly bush. 
So it's a really cool event. It's an all day. They have great speakers. It's open to the public for free. Wonderful. And Farmer's Cow has ice cream there too. So again, my name is Cindy Berry and please give me a call if you have any questions. Um, I want to thank the Groton Public Library and um, thank Anne for inviting us here. Hopefully this has been useful information for you.